welcome. This is the Education Committee, the Vermont House of Representatives, and we are uh, looking at our uh, Senate Bill 16, an act relating to the creation of a task force on exclusionary discipline, which are, we are also looking to change to the tax, a, a task force on equitable and inclusive school environments. We're trying to put that in the positive. So um, we are delighted to welcome you, and you are all... Um, I don't, the first we're going to be speaking with is, is Evelyn. Is it Monier from? It's Monhe. Monhe, uh, Evelyn Monhe. Yes, thank from, you. Uh, I should know to allow you to just introduce yourself so I don't butcher your name the first time we meet. Um, I would like to welcome um, Evelyn Monier from uh, Winooski High School, the Youth Program Specialist for Up for Learning. So welcome. We are. Um, interested in hearing your your response to the bill before us and and welcome and for the record could you introduce yourself yes and thank you so much so good afternoon everybody my name is Evelyn Monhe and I'm a Winooski High School student I am a leader and mentor in Winooski Students for Anti-Racism which is a youth group that addresses anti-racism within the Winooski School District um, I'm also consultant with the Vermont Equity Practitioners Network under the VPA and then finally, I am a youth program specialist at Up for Learning, which uh, is a nonprofit organization that explores youth adult partnership in education. I've been in the education system my whole life and through the work with my organizations um, that I've previously mentioned, I've been diving into restorative practices and, and real deeply rooted equity work. Um, I'm interested in exploring further the in the inequalities in our education in our education system and how we can begin to deconstruct and redesign our schooling and education with youth at the forefront. And I'll pass it to Towns. Thank you and welcome Towns to Groot. Awesome. My name uh yeah good afternoon. My name is Towns to Groot. Um, I am a senior at U32 High School. Uh, I am involved in a lot of restorative justice and restorative practices movements, including as a youth facilitator for Up For Learning, where I help train uh, other teachers and administrators and students of other schools uh, in restorative practices. I am a youth panel member for the Montpelier Community Justice Center, where I am working with young people who have uh, come into conflict with the legal system in some capacity, and uh, I, I do restorative justice with um, other other youths uh, in 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 the Montpelier Community Justice Center. I'm also a uh, in part of the restorative justice panel at U32, and have done a lot of restorative justice work within my own school. And I am a representative to the school board, um, and I think that. All these experiences have shown me uh, the how much school culture and environment is impacted and uh, how much of it is determined at the policy level, at the uh, level of the rules and regulations created by uh, the wider governing entities involved in, in schools and the importance of ensuring that uh, a good school environment through uh, at every level, especially in uh, the over uh, the policy level and the governance level. I'm going to pass it to Lindsay now. Welcome. Thank you. So good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, Towns, and thank you, Evelyn. Thank you all for having us. My name is Lindsay Hallman. I'm the executive director of the Vermont-based nonprofit organization, Up for Learning, which stands for Unleashing the Power Partnership for Learning. Um, we work with schools across the state, and I'll get into that in just a moment. But prior to joining Up for Learning, I taught middle school in Vermont for 15 years. During that time, um, about a decade of my teaching experience was co-creating the Edge Academy, which was a school within a public school, Essex Middle School, dedicated to applying the principles of student-centered and personalized learning. I've always believed that youth are the most valuable and transformative stakeholder in education. And they're often the one that, that have the least amount of say in the educational um, experience. 
Therefore, um, there should always be opportunities for you to be at the center of the decision making that impacts their educational experience. During my time as a middle level educator, I also spearheaded a school wide shift to restorative practices. I'm a nationally certified trainer of restorative practices. And like towns, I also volunteer at my local community justice center, the Essex Community Justice Center. And I serve as a co coordinator of the Vermont Restorative Approaches Collaborative. I also want to state that I'm a parent of a fourth grade student. Over the past, uh, over the course of the past 13 years, Up for Learning has worked with 95% of Vermont high schools, 50% of Vermont middle schools, and a growing number of elementary schools as they work towards systemic transformation, engaging all learners, and increasing the authentic voice of youth in learning and decision making. Up contributes to the capacity of youth organizations across Vermont and beyond to challenge inequities and raise up youth voices as they lead us to a public education system that is accessible, equitable, and radically inclusive of everyone. This means expansively modifying boundaries in a way which creates a difference in the possibilities for engagement, as well as creating spaces that are more accessible, welcoming, and inclusive of all youth and adults. Over the past two years, our work at Up for Learning um, with schools integrating youth adult partnership and restorative practices has been one of our biggest growth areas. And in 2019, 2020, the Agency of Education provided one year of funding for the Restorative Approaches Collaborative, and I attached um, the final report there um, to our written testimony, which was led by Up for Learning as the lead fiscal agent um, in partnership with UV UVM's BEST project. And I believe you heard about that last week from some of my colleagues. We supported seven schools and three school districts with the foundational learning and coaching needed to integrate tier one restorative practices, community building and relationship building into their schools. Implementation science shows that in order for systemic change to occur, it requires a deep commitment to change. And that is a multi-year process, three to five years at a minimum. This requires training, coaching, time and support for educators, students and families. It also involves resources to support schools in understanding the importance of tier one community building and relationship building pr practices as the foundation of this change and how this paradigm shift will ultimately create safer schools where young people feel connected and a sense of belonging. We know that one year funding is not enough to support systemic change. And this, we hope that this will be one consideration for the committee as you think about the purpose of this task force. And we'll get into that in just a moment. I'm gonna turn it over to Evelyn. Beautiful. I just wanted to reiterate all of our gratitude for each and every one of you for providing us the space um, to really speak to you and to open your ears to what we have to say. Um, we are very pleased to see that yesterday's version of the bill reflects the testimony of many of our colleagues and the people that we're in community with. We're particularly grateful to see the changing of the name on the task force um, to the Task Force on Equitable and Inclusive School Environments. This is, after all, about school climate. When thinking about behavior, behavior is a reflection of the climate and the environment. And so when thinking about the ways in which students are in some of the most foundational um, times in their life when in school, it's important that the climate um, reflects, the climate and environment reflects the space in which we want our youth to grow. And so in order to create that space, we have to really center ourselves in equitable and inclusive school environments. So again, thank you. And we have just a few more recommendations and considerations to add today. And we'll share these through our slides. Thank you. Um, yes. Yeah, is it, go ahead. Uh, um, I, I, we can give one of you a sharing experience, sharing. So we can to you. Okay. Yes, thank you. Okay, Jesse will give you, um, you are now a co-host, so please share. Okay, let's see. So we first wanted to start with some just considerations. And we know there's been a lot of thought and energy around this bill. And we um, were really, really uh, pleased and grateful to see all the considerations that already have taken place um, in the markup. Um, and so we just have a few more pieces to add. 
The first one really is around um, the root cause. And I think this got brought up last in, in multiple testimonies as well. But um, we know that the behavior is not the root cause. It's for young people, it's a lack of belonging, connectedness, wellness, relationships, and engaging learning opportunities. Those are likely the root causes, not to mention the institutional and structural racism and ableism. Those are root causes. You know, we look where I think Evelyn just pointed out that the changing the name to equitable and inclusive environments is really important because the environment is what creates the conditions for, for, for young people to feel that sense of belonging, connectedness, feeling well, feeling whole and engaged. Yes, Representative Austin slash Sarita. <laughs> I just think it might be helpful to define ableism. Yeah, ableism. Evelyn, do you want, to, want me to define it? Do you want to define it? I will let you define it and then if I have anything to add, I'll, I'll pop in. Thank you. Yeah. So when we think about um, able-bodied individuals, um, I mean, we're really thinking here around like young people who like we, we make assumptions in, in, our, in our school system that all young people are physically, emotionally, um, intellectually this, you know, at the same place. And that's not the case. And so it's not providing the resources, accessibility, inclusivity for all young people, no matter how they learn, no matter what challenges they face. Um, and so ableism is part of our, you know, we make a lot of assumptions about young people, what, what they can or cannot do. And so I'm not sure if that's the most um, dictionary definition, but, um, but it, it really gets at the fact that we um, as adults make a lot of assumptions within our system about what young people who, um, who have different identities, different learning capabilities, what they can and cannot do. Thank you. I'm gonna pass it over to Towns. Yeah, awesome. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about my personal experience working with students who have uh, maybe struggled with, uh, you know, following some of the, the rules that were at my, my school. Um, so last year and the year before, I was part, I was a youth, I wasn't really involved with the program at U32 that replaced our detention program, where um, essentially detention worked essentially like if, if a student broke a certain rule, they'd be sent to a room and they'd sit in that room for an hour and a half and they wouldn't do any work. And they, you know, uh, a lot of times were verbally uh, harassing the person who was overseeing detention and it never changed anything. Um, students, uh, you know, never learned anything. It just, it really was not effective in changing people's behavior. And so, um, the program that was, re that replaced it, um, which was, uh, facilitated by myself and by assistant principal Jody Emerson at U32, and also by, um, some other youth members of the restorative justice panel, depending on who was available, um, was called community. And the way that worked is that instead of being sent to detention, uh, students would come have a conversation with me and Jody, and we'd sit in her office and we would talk about what happened. And then eventually when we got past that, we would uh, have snacks and we would um, ask each other questions and we would learn about uh, each other. And it proved to be significantly more effective than detention. Um, whereas in, uh, when detention was implemented, we would often see students uh, uh, revisiting detention over and over and over and over again uh, throughout their uh, time at U32, whereas with community, um, we only ever had one or two students who returned uh, for multiple sessions of community, proving much more effective at changing people's behavior. Um, and what I learned, so one of the most common things that people were sent to community for was skipping class. And what I learned talking uh, to the people who skipped class 
was that the main reason they skipped class was because they felt they didn't have anything to offer to their class. Um, they, the students who skipped class had such a, a mindset about, you know, the, their own ability to contribute. Uh, and they, they honestly believed that they had nothing to contribute to the class and that in a lot of situations were actively uh, hampering the, the classes, uh, discussions and uh, the way that the classes progressed. And so they skipped class because they felt that like they, they uh, regardless of what anyone else in the class thought, they felt like they weren't, uh, they weren't helpful and that they wouldn't improve anything. So they skipped because they would rather, uh, you know, be doing something that, that where they felt valued. They'd rather be, be uh, hanging out with their friends, with people who actually, who they felt cared about them. And uh, to me, this is probably the one of, this shows me at least that the, one of the largest in, um, factors in, in students' behavior is feeling like uh, they have something to contribute. Because, you know, obviously I was having uh, lots of conversations with these kids and I could tell that they had something to contribute to their class. Um, I could tell that they had uh, really, uh, that they were really knowledgeable in some areas and really passionate about others. I could tell that, but it was clear to me that they couldn't tell that. And also that for a lot of their time in school, they had been told by people uh, in power that they didn't have anything to contribute, that they were disruptive, that they were, uh, you know, that they were ruining the class, that they were uh, interrupting other people's learning. And um, they had really taken that and internalized it to the point where uh, they, you know, they believe that they didn't have anything to offer. And that, that was why they were skipping class. And that was what was affecting their behavior. And it, it took, you know, having a conversation with um, me and Jody to start realizing that, you know, they, they clearly had something to offer their class and that they, they clearly were an important part of it. And, um, you know, it, it was so much more effective than any other, than any kind of punitive discipline in changing their behavior and in making them feel like an important part of the community and in creating a more supportive environment for them. Um, yeah, and uh, yeah. Sorry, Towns, did you wanna keep going? No, no, we're all good. We can, we can go on to the next slide. <laughs> okay. Awesome, thank you, Towns. I think that just points to the depth of how necessary and deeply rooted this work is when we know that our own students, our own children in this state feel as though they do not feel valued. And so when exploring what our next steps are in order to really honor their reality in our education system, it means we need to radically reimagine discipline data. And so ask ourselves, what is the current data going to show us that is different from what we already know? And we'll talk about this more, but we have so much data. There are plenty of case studies thinking about what's happening already to reduce and eliminate exclusionary practices. Look to schools and districts that are implementing restorative approaches in a critically conscious manner and centering our youth and their experience in the data collection. So in thinking about this, for example, Burlington School District, Winooski School District are really diving into that restorative practices piece really diving into what their students and youth are looking for. Um, and when I think about this, it really feels essential for us to be putting our youth at the forefront, having them be a part of our data collection. There's so much information from the outside looking in that we need to really know what, what students' reality is on the day-to-day -day basis. And I think Towns talked a lot about that, is that is what we need to be looking at. We can see those numbers but we really need to touch base with our youth who are in school every day to think about their reality. Um, and that's what this task force needs to be doing is to be diving in. Um, Cause we often 
begin this practice of returning um, to looking for more information and pulling in more and more and more and more and more data um, when what our students need is action and conversation and dialogue and listening from the heart and really, really centering them because we can't be doing education um, in any other way than to prioritize our youth. So thank you and I'll pass it to our next person. Thank you, I'm gonna, would like to just, I see Representative Brady has a question. Representative Brady? Yes. Yeah, thank you. I just wanna note while we're on that, I um, because I've been working on this bill and meeting with folks on the language, I've learned a lot about the data that exists um, over the last week and um, would have probably advocated for some of the same things you're noting here, but there are a lot of limitations um, legally around state and federal laws and student privacy that while it might, that, that are gonna preclude the ability of some of those kinds of, of data. So I just, I fully acknowledge, you know, the, the spirit of the suggestions and they're, again, ones I would have brought to this um, initially, but I'm, I've learned a lot about what some of those limitations are around privacy and it, it has a tremendous impact on the data we can collect, for, particularly something like case studies or individual student stories um, it, it are going to be problematic for us to put into any kind of policy um, here. Mm -hmm. So I just wanted to note that while we're looking at it. I appreciate that. Yeah, you can I collect it, but government really can't. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yes. And I think, you know, when referring to case studies, it's looking at districts that are already doing this work. And what are they finding just in general terms around, you know, um, belonging, relationships, connectedness, reductions in, you know, disciplinary actions. Um, and I don't, and I, I understand the laws, you know, around privacy for young people, but I think it's, you know, um, trying to figure out what are the other types of data sources that could help us really understand the, the full issue here. And so, yes, I agree with the privacy piece. And we were hoping that even in the work that we do at Up For Learning, you know, when we, when we go through our process with schools, with youth participatory action research, youth are engaging the community in um, collecting data around whatever it is that they're, the issue that they are focusing on, but it's not individualized data. You know, they're looking at a community community-wide data. So I wonder where that might, where there's a, a little bit of a, a balance there too, of like um, looking at individual school districts. I don't really, I don't know all the ins and outs of that, so. Thank you. And we can certainly bring these things to the advisory. Uh, the, the beauty is, is that we don't have to answer all of these things now. Exactly. Okay, Representative Brady, did you have more on that? Okay, Representative Austin. Yep, um, thank you. When I look at data and, you know, I think the disciplinary data um, is tough, but when I'm looking at uh, data for academic performance, um, like I will look for like a poverty rate of the school and then I'll look at their proficiency scores and what I would find glaring, let's say Smiley School outside of Richmond, you know, they had a really high percentage of poverty, but also very high proficiency score. So that would stand out to me. It's like, what is that school doing um, that is getting such good uh, academic scores? So I wonder if we looked at the kind of the, we have the behavior, you know, we have the number of suspensions and expulsions in data, but looking at schools that have much lower, maybe similar profiles, but have much lower uh, percentages of students being expelled or uh, suspended. And then, you know, asking the question, like, what are they doing? Um, and I wouldn't be surprised if it was restorative uh, practices, you know, so that would just kind of confirm that this works, that this method works. I can I can confirm that for you actually because I do know a bit about Smiley. I don't know a ton, but a school like Smiley, Smiley was a part of the restorative approaches collaborative work over 2019, 2020. So the elementary schools in MMU USD were all part of that. 
So when you look at what are they doing, they're centering social emotional learning and relationships that is at the top. We know, I mean, I know as an educator and the data shows that, that when young people are, when they have that time to um, connect, to be engaged in, and when social and emotional learning is at the top of the list and relationships, academic achievement, you know, what their academic outcomes, that comes along with it. It doesn't, you know, that's, that's the outcome of feeling a sense of connection, belonging, so I know that Smiley has done a lot of really, really good work when you think of a school like Smiley. It doesn't matter, you know, like the circumstances of a young person, what they bring with them does matter. And, you know, they're, and it comes down to those pieces, engagement, youth engagement, and social emotional learning. And when those are prioritized as, you know, those are the priorities of a school, the academic pieces that you see, you know, there's a direct correlation. So I know that you get that too. Yeah. I didn't I know that about keep, I want to keep keep our pace going as well. I know that that some of us have a tremendous amount of background and interest in this, but I also want to use this time to help us in developing the bill that we is before us. So I want to um, I'm not sure who was next. Thank you. Um, yeah, I just wanted to Agree. Echo and, and echo the how, as we mentioned previously, it's the, the culture and environment of our students that determines their behavior. Um, and so this next piece is a language consideration in, in S16 and thinking about transformative policies, anti-racist, anti-ableist, which pulls us back to that ableism piece and, and racism piece and trauma-informed practices, making sure that we are youth-centered parent and caregiver centered, making sure that they are a part of this work when thinking about who, um, where the data is coming from, who's a part of this work. And then finally, this two and four versus with, and I'll pass it over to Towns to talk a little bit more about that. Yeah, yeah. Um, so a lot of times in, in restorative justice and restorative practices, we characterize different forms of discipline um, as, you know, uh, to, for, and with, essentially meaning that a punitive approach to, um, to discipline is doing things to people, you know, um, a, uh, a permissive approach to discipline is doing things for people, and a restorative approach to discipline is doing things with people. Um, and if, if there's one thing that I want everyone here to really keep at the forefront of their mind in regards to this bill, it is the importance of doing of every part of this process being done with young people and with and with people in schools. Um, you know, uh, out for learning, we do a lot of work around youth adult partnerships. That's that's something that that uh, is constantly uh, in our minds. And what that means essentially is that youth are equal partners in uh, in, in 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 an action. They share the responsibility and the resources with the adults and actively work together. And I think it is not just important that this uh, bill, you know, in include youth voice and that the uh, task force include youth voice, it is necessary. It is, you know, the, the most important thing to me um, because ultimately there, there is no point in changing a system if you are not hearing from the people who those changes affect. Um, and I think that it is not only important to include youth, it is important to share in the power with them. Um, it is important that you aren't just using youth as, as, as a resource, but that you are supporting their, uh, the ideas that they come to the table with. You are um, working with them. A lot of the times when I see youth working with adults. It is where adults go, go to youth and are like, hey, 
we need help with this thing. What do you think? And then you say, oh, this is what I think about this. And the adults leave and they, and then they develop everything, everything from there. That's not true youth adult partnership. Um, true youth adult partnership is, you know, the, the, the youth being involved every step of the way. And that is to me the, the most important thing that, that could be done uh, and is, is the way of ensuring that the changes to uh, schools that are made are, are effective, uh, necessary, and um, are responding to actual issues within the school. So we had just some recommendations um, for change, and one was fairly straightforward, um, but also maybe not so straightforward, maybe complex. In the bill, um, it says most serious student behaviors. And we would ask that you create a definition or this task force creates a de definition for what most serious student behaviors are. Because the concern is if it's not defined, that schools are gonna interpret this in many different ways which is just gonna further the inequities in our educational system. And we've seen that with a lot of other really transformative policies that we'll talk about Act 77. You know, if it's not really defined fully, then how it gets interpret interpreted can be either detrimental for young people or truly transformative. So we really um, hope that this task force will, could create a definition for what that means, most serious student behaviors. Evelyn, did you wanna to add to that? Yeah, I wanted to offer just my own personal experience with that, that sort of non, when things aren't clearly defined. Um, and so within the past around eight to 10 months, Winooski has, Winooski Students for Anti-Racism, which is a youth group that I work with, um, has brought anti-racist demands to our school district. Um, and in the process of implementation of those demands that are, that are centered in anti-racism, um, one of them was the removal of the SRO and replacing it, that role with two trauma specialists. And throughout the past two weeks to a month, we've really dove in on this as the, the school board decision um, on whether to keep or remove the SRO role um, was this past Wednesday. And a part of this, this dialogue, which became really challenging, was um, many of our youth um, and was saw, was saw, and then and then um, folks in the community saw this figure as a disciplinary figure. So someone who disciplines students, um, and in having conversations with our youth at Winooski School District, um, was saw Winooski students for anti-racism were informed that the school the school resource officer is not in fact a disciplinary figure and is in fact a, discipline is a nuanced term. And so when there isn't clear definition, it's really challenging to convey specifically why um, we're working towards specific goals. And so our goal as centered in anti-racism was to remove the disciplinary figure that has been centered in racism for the, in the entirety of its, of its um, you know, the system of policing. Um, and with that nuanced term, it takes all the power out of out of what we're speaking about because there's there's room for interpretation and so while the school does not determine as discipline and many youth don't and many youth do and many of our multilingual community um, as we're a refugee resettlement town a lot of those folks did refer to to the sro as a um, disciplinary figure for their kids and they appreciated that and so with the differing um, interpretations, again, it just makes it really challenging to know specifically what the next steps are when something occurs. And when thinking about most serious student behaviors, if there's different interpretations, there's going to be room for those inequities to, to bleed into the ways in which we make decisions. Um, and so they may be rooted in systemic inequalities because that's the way that things are always done. Um, when the, the reality is that we need to be pushing for other alternatives. Um, and so having those clear definitions is really the way to begin to explore that and make sure that everybody's on the same page 
Um, also thinking about parents, how essential it is for them to understand specifically what their students, what the expectations of their students are within school and, and what it looks like for them to be safe and for them to be, um, you know, students. And, and the difference between youth behavior and something that is, is serious um, and dangerous to a, a student uh, themselves or others and, and what that looks like. So thank you, I'm gonna pass it to- Thank you. And um, I, Representative Brady, you're, you've made a note of that, I'm, I'm quite sure. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, I, I, I just yeah. point out quickly the bill actually does call for the task force to define the most serious behaviors after considering um, that they should remain eligible for suspension or expulsion. That's actually a specific task for the group. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you for pointing that out. Um, I see and, from Representative James. Yeah. Thanks, and thank you so much for being here today. Um, I'm curious to explore a little bit. Um, the, the bill includes two students on the task force. And so when you talk about, you know, centering students' voices and the importance of students' voice, um, which I agree with, what, is that, what does that look like to you? How, how is that different from putting students on the, on the task force? Um, for me personally, I think the, the main difference comes in the uh, level of power and responsibility that is given to the students. I think that, and also um, in, in the way that the students are, are used in the context of the task force. Um, if if, if uh, students are brought on not as um you know resources to be used but as full partners to um share in the the work and to um to kind to you know be people who uh are are respected and whose ideas and uh thoughts are actively sought out and then supported I, I think that that's a, a step in the right direction i i think it would in my ideal situation uh it would also involve not it would also you froze up for a moment yeah i think you're frozen reaching out I think you're freezing, Towns. Towns, do you want to try turning off your camera? Out to use in up. I, I guess the most important thing for me is that youth on the panel. Um, I, I don't know if you know two youth representatives is enough to to uh, fully hear from the diverse experiences of young people, but I think it's a great start. And I think that if that is supplemented by um, the task force, you know, when, when, when task force, for example, looks at schools that have a successful or an unsuccessful disciplinary system, looking at the uh, hearing from the experiences of, of young people at those schools and talking to them directly instead of looking at raw data and uh, talking to the administrators at the school, but also going directly to, to the youth, to the people who are most impacted and hearing from them. And now that, that is, Towns, that is something that is available to the group as they're working. They can mm -hmm. ask for testimony. Mm -hmm. They can ask for groups to come in and testify before them. So we don't actually need to add everybody. We just make, need to make sure that there's an avenue for them to be heard and participate. Yeah. And so that would be, would be available. Yeah, and participate in a meaningful way. The only thing I'm thinking about is, and I don't know what you think, of, think about this or what you think about this, Chair Webb, but... Um, you know, so the two students are appointed just like all the other task force members. Um, so they're, they've got the same seat at the table as, as everybody else. Um, but who those students are is going to be 
critical, obviously, to sort of achieving the kind of um, rep representation and outreach that you're you're talking about, Towns. And um, I don't know where. Sometimes we don't know where language. Uh, sometimes I don't know where language originated from. <laughs> and it it mentions here that. Um, the two students would be appointed by the Vermont Principals Association. And perhaps it's worth considering um, that those two, I don't know where that idea came from. I don't think it's necessarily a bad idea, but maybe those two students could be um, appointed by another organization that would be a little bit more boots on the ground here. I, yeah, I, yeah that out there. I think that would be, that's a great idea. Um, something I, I run into a lot is I tend to run into the same students over and over and over again when, when I am, uh, like, you know, uh, involved with restorative justice groups. And I think it's really important that um, students who, uh, that, uh, you know, you're capturing a, a more, more diverse student uh, voice. So I think that's a great idea. Um, yeah, I, I agree, Towns. And um, whether it's the VPA or it's, you know, another organization, you know, Up For Learning works with schools across the state with youth and adults that are doing this work. And so, you know, um, if you're looking for, you know, um, the youth that are not maybe always asked to be at the table, we could certainly help with that too. Um, we also have a really robust youth advisory council. Um, and, but I, but I do think that we have a good pulse and read on youth that are involved in this work in their schools. We can certainly, we, you know, I think it was just, if we just pulled the Vermont Principals Association out, but we could certainly look at, it, you know, when we mark this up, we could look at you as being a potential appointee. That'd be great. And we'd be happy to. And and I would just add, and I think I'm just going to skip forward, Evelyn, and um, and then we can go back if we have time. Um, one of the one of the memberships that's not listed is middle school youth. And um, Evelyn Towns and I had a, a a a conversation about this. As a former middle level educator, the perspective of middle school youth is critical because we know or. As a middle school educator, I knew that is a make or break stage in their life. Like all the data says that, you know, by that age group, they have really um, been given the messages about their path in the future and which, you know, what what that's going to be. And so why just high school youth? You know, is it um, is there a rationale behind that? And Towns, I know you were going to speak to the middle school piece, too. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I've talked to a lot of middle schoolers, and I think that my personal experience has been that their input has been invaluable and is often um, very separate from the experience of, of people in high school, and that oftentimes uh, they have insights that are, are not present in, in, in a, uh, an insight that someone in high school might have. And you know, it comes back to the part of uh, asking, of talking to the people who are uh, who are going to be most affected by the decisions the task force makes. And middle school middle schoolers are absolutely a group that that are going to be effective, and therefore should be heard, heard from. Thank you. So I think I'll move forward. I think this was Towns just talking about just building off of the data and then moving into policy, right? We have just a couple more pieces. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so a lot of the times in uh, that I see people come in when they're discussing things like atmosphere and environment and culture in a school, they talk about data collection. And um, I think the, the truth is that all of this data has for the most part already been collected. Uh, and that it's really important uh, that as a task force, a task force move past data collection and uh, start working immediately on actionable steps and on implementing that data and what has already known and has been known for years into uh, a plan to um, you know, positively impact school community and school environment. Um, all of these questions 
we have answers to, and data has been gathered both, both on a statewide level and in, in schools individually. Um, and so it stops being about asking questions like how many youth are engaged in their learning. It starts beginning about asking questions like how can we engage youth more in their learning? Uh, and then creating a, a plan based on that. I think, and then the the building off of that piece, Evelyn, I didn't interrupt you, did I? I think I'm here, right? Yeah, building off of that piece, looking at how to, this we hope the task force will connect their recommendations to the promising practices that are already in place. For example, Act 77, Flexible Pathways, that's about student engagement. How can we engage youth so that they have flexible pathways to graduation based on proficiency-based graduation requirements and personalized learning. That's already in play. Act one. So if act 77 is the, the pathway and how, act one is the what. How do we create you know, learning opportunities that are truly equitable and, and center all people's experiences in the educational experience? And then there's current proposed bills like H106 around community schools. That is so connected to this as well. So many connections. So that the hope is that you're not creating another silo with this task force. You're actually creating like a, a synergy amongst all of these promising policies and practices that are in place. Um, I'll turn it over to Evelyn. Representative Austin, did you have a question? Sorry. Um, it was, it kind of went back. Just, um, I'm wondering um, if, the youth risk behavior survey, if they ask different questions, like maybe if youth were involved in um, developing that survey, if that would be a vehicle that might serve to get that data? Yeah, so Up for Learning has obviously with our Getting to Why program where we have youth and adults, town's been a part of that, um, analyzing their own local youth risk, youth risk behavior survey data and then creating change. That's been a big part of our of our work over the past 13 years. And we have um, in our partnership with the health department, we have um, they are very, very uh, supportive of incorporating youth voice in. But it's been a slow moving process, just like all of these pieces. We just recently in this last um, in, this, in, the, in the most current um, YRBS, we had youth uh, actually contribute to some of the questions. Some of the questions are standard CDC, CDC questions, they come, they're national questions. And then others, Vermont does have the ability to create some and they have brought youth into the process of creating questions. So that is really promising as well. Thank you. Thank you for the question. It's really appreciated. Um, yeah, I wanted to offer some more, some more thoughts on transformative policy and provide another just continuation of what I was talking about on the SRO and related to transformative policy and then also related to all of the things that this, this bill will support. Um, when thinking about how to create that equitable and inclusive space and environment in school, a lack thereof of, of equity and truly rooted inclusivity, we're harming our students. And so when I think about Winooski School District, who I love, they are, they are my school and I, I care for them very deeply. And the, the school board decision was to retain the SRO position and that's harming our students. And so in not creating transformative policy that deeply, deeply identifies where the root causes of harm are, we are not creating a system that's, that's designed specifically for our students. And so as you know, a high school senior, I feel so deeply connected to our youth and our students. It is our job to make sure that education is designed for them. And in order to truly make sure that they are safe and that they belong, and that their school environment as they enter in preschool through 12th grade, as we prepare them for the world, that we are deeply, truly making sure that the spaces in which they are learning are equitable 
and that they are inclusive. And so that looks like creating transformative policy that really identifies those spaces and uses the data that has been collected in order to make that happen. We just, we've already talked about the middle school youth, um, but we'd hope that also there is a really robust group of practitioners, educators, um, higher ed folks that are part of the restorative uh, approaches collaborative. This was the collaborative that was formed um, when um, the Agency of Education created an RFP for a professional provider for restorative approaches in schools. It was a one year contract. Up for Learning was the lead fiscal agent, and I was part of the coordination team with the best project. Um, there's a group of 40 plus practitioners who have worked in schools across the entire state. I should also mention community justice center um, staff members are part of that as well. Um, and I would I know that there are a lot of people that are on this committee or this task force already, but thinking about the folks that are doing the work in schools to create these kinds of changes, it'd be really um, it'd be really helpful to have a member of the restorative approaches collaborative engaged in that. And so, everyone, oh yeah, go ahead. Who's the director? Well, the director of that, so the coordination team was myself from Up for Learning and Amy Wheeler Sutton okay. um, from The Best Project. We are in a, it's a voluntary coordination right now because we had a one year, we had a one year contract with the AOE. So we are kind of holding this Vermont Restorative Approaches Collaborative um, group. Um, we have a website, vtrack.org, which has a ton of resources that was part of our contract to create a virtual library and resource. And we have a directory. But um, so you can reach out to me and I and, or Amy, you know, and, and either of us could could put the call out. I will say that one of the challenges we always have in this committee, we always have in all committees is having a task force that has enough members, but not too many members. And then who do you cut and who do you keep? And it can feel very personal when we're doing that. And we will sometimes end up with a there's a certain number that works really well together. And then there's one where it just really gets to be too many. So I, I, we, we certainly would appreciate you taking a look at it. And if we sort of limited, there's got to be a limit here somewhere. And probably is 18 is probably where it should be. Mm -hmm. Agree. What's the most, what, what, who do we really need on this? And who do we already know about them? <laughs> We, they can, we can ask them later, but who needs to be sitting at the table? Yeah, practitioners, people that are doing the work, mm -hmm. youth. I would, you know, um, you're, I think that, you know, that is the, the people that are in the field doing the work are the people that need to be part of the task force. Um, there are a lot of people that are designees to appoint others. Um, Evelyn, do you want to speak to the creation of the task force or the steering committee that we just created in Winooski and how that, you know? Yes, for sure. So that was sort of my piece on where I'm feeling Winooski is. I'm having some trouble with Winooski, but now here's some joy. And so we have, we, we meaning Lindsay and myself and some really key essential folks at Winooski School District um, have spent many months creating a steering committee that will hold the the communication and definition and organization of what anti-racism looks like at Winooski School District. And a part of that is um, the demand groups. And so each group would handle one of the demands that WASA brought to the school board. Um, and a part like really deeply rooted in, in what we wanted this to look like was having it be radically inclusive. And that sounds kind of crazy and way out there, but really it's just making sure that everybody is a part of this work. And so, um, as I previously mentioned, Winooski has, uh, is a multilingual community. So we met with our home to school or school home, homeschool liaisons. So our major language communities, Nepali, Somali, um, Swahili, et cetera, and decided how to best approach these communities in order for them to be able to easily ac access the information we wanted to give them and for them to be able to be present with us. Lindsay and I held two informational sessions with translation available for folks who wanted to come and ask further questions. 
Um, we had trans translated flyers that we put up around Winooski School District. And in the end, I think we had around 25 people apply and we had 20 people who were selected. Um, and while not representative of Vermont, it was representative of Winooski in terms of um, race and gender. We have five youth um, who are a part of WASA and they are some of the most incredible people on planet Earth. They're gonna run, help run um, a three hour training on what WASA is all about. Um, and they're in middle and early high school. And so just thinking about how, asking yourself the questions, like how do we pull in these people who are not traditionally centered? How do we pull in these people um, that history has erased that are so essential to this work? And moving forward in education, we have to be prioritizing these people. We have to be creating that transformation. And that looks like asking ourselves those questions. Lindsay or Towns, did you have anything yeah, to add I know to that? that it's, yes, thank you, Evelyn. I know that it says that the appointing um, organizations will ensure that there's racial diversity, but we're taught, you know, how are they going to make sure that this task force is inclusive and offers whatever is needed to make people feel like they are a part of this work? And so um, it's one thing to invite people to the table, but it's another to create the environment and the atmosphere and the climate for people to work together to create change. So um, yeah, I think just thinking through like what what needs to happen in order to make this group, this task force, one that is inclusive of, of all people, but most importantly, those that have been dis marginalized by the system. Um, since we are talking about creating in equitable and inclusive school environments. So the original bill, I'll just say the original that came over from the Senate actually listed characteristics of a group, but had them all appointed by the secretary. And right. their indication for, for thinking that way had to do with the fact that they thought that they they would be able to bring in people that maybe weren't what as we call them the usual suspects. Um, so do you have any comments on whether that idea would be better than us having uh, groups appointing? Leaving it, leaving it to the secretary to do the appointments where he has more flexibility to choose from different groups. And you give it up to one person. <laughs> yeah. Hey, I, yeah, I think like, what is the system? You know, like how do people have um, knowledge about how to be part of this task force? I think this gets at a larger piece or that Evelyn and Towns could likely speak to is like, who has access to this process and who who does not? Who is this process, you know, for and who is it not for? And how are people, you know, I think it's better to have multiple folks that are in different communities doing the reach out than one person. I mean, that would be, I, I wouldn't, you know, I think, but I think what Evelyn was speaking to is like creating the, um, the protocols and systems to ensure that people had knowledge about it, that there was actually an application process. So like that to us felt like that was something, you know, and, and an application process that was one that was, you know, if people needed assistance with the application, they could get assistance. Um, so again, is it just um, like, if it was my organization just saying, well, I know a couple of young people that are really great, they could be part of this, like, is that truly an equitable, an equitable way to create this task force. At the same time, we don't want to prolong this this um, the task force. Like the the main point here is to get to action, right? And so, I think it's great to have people appointing from their communities or their organizations. But I think the that the language should be to really the hope is that they are looking for um, diverse perspectives. Evelyn or Towns, do you have? Thoughts on that? Yeah, I think I, you know, generally agree with everything that you've said. And, um, you know, I, I think that when you're considering, uh, you know, who to talk to and who, who to involve, um, it's, it's really important that you, uh, you know, in, in uh, you t take the time to, uh, to truly, uh, find a, a diverse group of, of, of people and that it, you know, I, I understand that time is an issue, but I, I think that it is, 
more important to do something effectively and well and well considered um, and have it take a long time than to not do it as well and have it take a shorter time. Okay, so I, I see we're at your last slide and I want to make sure that you yes. to finish your, your yeah. presentation. So we are, thank you. Um, so, I mean, this is just, this is not necessarily, um, it's connected and not connected, but that, you know, based on the work that um, I helped to co-coordinate with the Vermont Restorative Approaches Collaborative, that was a one year, um, one year of funding from the AOE to support schools in moving towards restorative environments. One year it cannot be enough. We know that it's a multi-year process for systemic change. And um, and so just thinking you know forward to what is needed to really support schools is that they're the, the need for resources and to amplify the practices, not the initiatives. And I think that came across in the testimony last week too. Like what are the what are the practices that are powerful practices that we should see in every school? advisory structures, culturally responsive curriculum, restorative approaches, an emphasis on the practices and not initiatives. This is not a curriculum that a, you know, a task force can say, this is our recommendation. These are practices and they take time for, for educators and for communities to really understand um, what they are and how, to, and how to really change their way of thinking, their mental models. Thank you. We certainly do realize that the transformations that have happened in Winooski did not happen in a couple of weeks or even a couple of years. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. And final thoughts? Evelyn and Towns, final thoughts? I don't think so. I think we said, I think we said everything I had to say just to really sit with it. And how can we how can we engage youth? That's I know we've we've pushed that a lot, but just thinking about <laughs> all of those opportunities um, and how essential and bright our students are, and they need to have that communicated to them from the beginning um, that there are opportunities for them to create real systemic change, and you all have have the power to do that. Thank you. It's it's very clear to us that this didn't come to us asking if there was a problem. Um, that has already been declared. And now what are we going to do about it? Mm. Um, so that's what we are looking yes. to this task force to do to advise uh, yeah. on a statewide basis. And this probably won't be done in a couple of weeks or a couple of years. No. But at least put us on the road. <laughs> Indeed. Towns, any other final thoughts from you? Uh, I, I think uh, I think that, you know, everything that uh, I could say has already been said, um, and I think that it, uh, I, I hope that, that going forward, the, uh, you know, just keep in mind um, <clears throat> the importance of, of, um, of taking action, I think, is something that um, I don't want to stress is that it's very, very important that uh, the task force be action focused and uh, able to like um, to implement change and be able to receive feedback on their implementation and adjust course um, as necessary. Just, I think that, that it's very important that instead of talking about these issues, uh, we start doing something about them. Yeah. Thank you. Um, very much appreciate, appreciate having you. We also, uh, this committee happens to really appreciate hearing from students as well. That's always important to us. And we miss last year when our committee room would be full of students. Um, and so we really appreciate that to, to have you join us today. And we will take your uh, recommendations into account. Um, I think we've heard them. And uh, thank you.
Thank you. Yeah, thank you for accommodating um, Towns and Evelyn's schedule. It's not easy for young people to be able to show up to testify just with their with their schedule. So thank you. Yeah, so we, we are more than we were more than happy to wait and not not complete this without their input. Yeah, just thank you again. Sending you all so much gratitude. I want to make sure that's really communicated. <laughs> so much gratitude. Gratitude back to you as well. We are going to continue a little conversation on some of the, the questions on the bill um, at this point. So I appreciate your, your input very much. Thank you. All right, we will leave then. Thank you. Take care, everyone. Thank you. Um, Representative Brady, you had started us um, some of our markup questions. You, you and Representative Conlon worked with a few folks this morning looking at areas uh, under development in this bill. Yes. So we have three points of a committee decision. I emailed you and Peter uh, and, and Jesse too with this list, um, a bunch of things we don't need to, to deal with. Number one is the task force. So that is on page, starts on page four. Um, we've gone back and forth on numbers of how many in it. So we need to make a decision on how big it is and whether it's up to the agency to appoint people from certain groups or to stick with specific uh, specific groups. The NEA and BPA joined us today in a long meeting to work on the language and continue to support the idea of naming specific groups to be involved in the work for what it's worth. Put that question out. So, so yeah. Um, does the committee want to continue to we, that we will define the people who will appoint as we had started versus the uh, Senate bill? that had had the secretary. So are we continuing on that, that road? Just gonna see a thumbs up. Is there a document that needs to be put up or not that you were working on, Representative Brady? You can bring the bell. bell well, I, I just have my notes, but working on the latest version of the, the okay. bell. So on, okay. we're on page four of it. I, it. Do you want us to pull up the bill? No, I'll pull it up. I just didn't okay. know if there was another, okay. you had done revisions on the bill. So okay, so question then within that list. Um, I'm actually not sure on page five, line 12, where one member appointed by the National Center on Restorative Justice at the Vermont Law School, where that one came from. Not either. Um, and I would like, I would like to see it be the collaborative that, um, the restorative justice collaborative that we were just hearing about and we got the grant request uh, you know from them kate uh or, or related to their work on that but given that that organization already exists it was done in coordination with aoe in 2019 um i'm comfortable I would, switching that out i'd swap that out so like, I'll follow that up with Jim I'm, seeing okay head, there. I'm seeing head nodding swap that okay. out okay so we'll swap right. it up Anybody again? The student thing we obviously just talked about, but do we leave that up to VPA? Do we want to make that up for learning to decide? I got a, a text from from principals. They said that was fine. We could have them for learning. We could have them be the naming agency, but right. put in language. It just says in coordination with uh, up for learning. Great. Okay. What, and just put that in the draft? Okay. Yeah. Um, and then are we sticking with the overall number of a giant task force? <laughs> Let Dear we, Lord. You, do you want to try limiting it? <laughs> How many do we have? 19. I know. I would think to say your 14 is about perfect. But 13, I, yeah. I, I mean, I can't 19, believe I'm saying this. Yeah. But the two teachers, I, I don't know. We have we have the NEA or designee, right? Yeah, that's the other way of looking at it. You could look at the secretary that you know, so you'll get they they could that would be three then from the NEA. Um, so and depending on decisions we make going forward, 
we probably do not need the executive director of the Vermont Independent Schools Association. That's yeah, I wondered about that one too. Yeah. Okay. So we'll strike it. <laughs> so take off the two teachers named by NEA. Not quite yet. <laughs> yeah. I don't know about that. That? that. That's a hard one. That one feels yeah. a little harder. I did, yeah. So um so we're taking off independent schools, but we do want a therapeutic school. That's on there, right? That's, yes. that's oh yep. yeah. Well, that is what's on there for independent schools, isn't it? No, there's G. Well, as well as the, the executive director's on there too. Do we need the ACLU? Yeah, I, don't you think? I mean, well, we've got legal aid, Vermont Family Network. Um, to me, there's a little bit of redundancy there. I agree. I would agree. And the ACLU is probably stretched pretty thin. Did they ask to be on? I guess that's why I'm. They testified, but I don't remember. Yeah. So, and we can put it in a draft, and we can send we can send it to them and say. Just looking for the next language for the next draft. So what do so, you know? we're striking because we don't have we don't have Jim in the room right now. So I'm just taking yeah. notes to get to yeah, circle back yeah. to Jim. So, so we're taking, taking out ACLU. Um, yeah. yeah, I'm seeing some yeses. Yeah, it, it, it's not permanent yet. We haven't voted. We're not voting it out. We're okay. taking off G, the executive director of the Mont Independent Schools. Yep. So I just have a question about that. Yep. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I, um, uh, before you ask uh, Rep. James, I think I can anticipate your question. Thank you. Just that as we go through the bill, what we're going to discover is that there's no data. We almost need to write this bill that doesn't in a way that doesn't include them. Okay. They don't have to. Great. They don't have to collect the same data. They don't. You know. So anyway. As long as that's how the bill is currently reading or comes to read, that's fine by me then. That, that's why I suggested taking out that person. De and I said, depending on how we progress through the bill. Okay. And it, it's a question perhaps for a later discussion, but it, it's, not, it's, not, it's not on the emergency fast level. Uh, so, so where we are right now, we just took out G. Yep. At the moment, we're looking at taking out N. Yep. We're looking at swapping the restorative justice for oh. the other group. For the collaborative? Right. Yep, I'll give Jim the language on that, L, yep. So we've deleted two. <laughs> so that brings us to 17. Yeah. And we, we, could, we could cut a teacher rather than both. That still well, doesn't feel right. Can we add the director of up for learning or a designee? We were going to have the, at the moment, we have the students appointed by up for learning, I think. But I think um, having the director or a designee would, I mean, I feel that like they Could would, you replace somebody? Could you knock somebody off to bring them in? I want to either uh, the school, uh, teacher, one of the teachers. I mean, that, I just it's, think we just we just swapped out the collaborative, which I think is includes up for learning for the um, National Center for Restorative Justice. Right. So they, they are right. they are not going to be without influence here. Yep. I I mean I just I've seen what Lindsay I'm just going to say this I've seen what Lindsay has done in terms of bringing about change throughout Vermont in terms of being an, a huge advocate for student voice. Is Lindsay on the, on the collaborative? I think her organization is. But I, I would really, if we want to accomplish what we want to accomplish, I, I think we have to have her voice at the table. She, she represents student voice. I want to put it to the co committee. I think you've made your point. Uh, I'm, I'm personally not um, well enough informed as to the definitions of what best is, what up for learning is, 
Um, and I and I know that we've expanded the name of this task force, but it's still pretty narrowly focused on suspensions and expulsions. Um, so I guess uh, I, I don't have a strong opinion here one way or the other, but uh, I guess if we're going to do that, then I think you need to pick a swap out. I don't want to see this list grow. I think that's an important reminder that this is focused on suspension and expulsion. It's not, it's not necessarily focused on restorative practice as much as that's where we're going. But right now we have a problem with, with those two issues. So what's the committee's preference? Um, I guess I just, I'm frantically trying to Google. So if, if Lindsay's organization is part of the collaborative, I guess I'm just trying to think the odds of her being the appointee anyway, without making the list longer. Is there redundancy with best and having Lindsay on there? Or her, her organization? That's what it just seemed like we're kind of in the same sphere of yeah. So I, interests I would, and and work. Um, so I don't know. I think it's just too big overall. So I'm I just am really hesitant to say adding any more specifics. And I without, agree. Without moving somebody off, I, I agree. You know, one of the problems with these task force uh, these task force things are most of the time when they meet eight or nine people show and the other ones yeah. don't. Having been part of some of this in the past, not everybody shows. It's kind of difficult. And they can always- And obviously the work most of the time really doesn't get done. They can always bring somebody in to speak too that's over and above the membership. Right, they can bring in, they can bring in whomever they want. So I don't know what we're down to at this point. Um, well, we've taken down two. If we're not touching two. the teachers, we're down two. So do you want to just- 17. Did that bring us to 17? That brings us to 17. I mean, do we need the superintendents, the school boards, the principals? I, I was looking at the same thing. Could we say- I, I just wonder, that's a lot there too. Some administrator. <laughs> yeah. Someone who's an administrator. Yeah, let's knock off either the principals or the superintendents. I'm inclined to think that the principals actually know better what's going on in the schools. I, I am too, and they've been more involved. I mean, Jay's been much more tuned into this than. Let's take off the superintendents. I would take off the superintendents as well. Okay. The okay. boards right. do policy and the principals are in the, in the buildings. Got it. And then take it down to one teacher. Is that what you're thinking? Ooh, then we get down to 15. Ooh. I like that number. That's a good day to work. <laughs> yeah, let's, let's keep going. Is the executive director of the NEA need to be there because we already have two teachers appointed by no, the we NEA? Have, we used to have two. Now we have one. <laughs> We're going to go okay. one teacher. Yeah. Okay, so we don't need the executive director of the NEA there. Well, I, I would want two teachers if we took out the NEA personally. Yeah, yeah. I would I would agree with keeping two teachers if we're taking the NEA out. Yeah. Why? I agree. Plus, does it doesn't it have to be an odd number? No. For votes. No. No, because no, you can't get all of them to agree anyway. So. Yeah. The quorum. <laughs> this is the quorum. Okay, I think that was amazing. Let's okay. put it aside. Uh, by the way, I did, I did suggest to Kate uh, that what the House of Representatives needs is a committee whose job it is to just name people to committees and task force. Peter, let's, make everybody's task, life. let's put a task yeah, force together on that. <laughs> okay, next to decision point, page 10. If you're following along as the date of the report. We had some good discussion around this. Uh, the AOE raised concern about the how realistic it would be to stand up and get this work done by November 30th of this year. I, I hear we that. had a discussion around potentially um, having a two-part uh, 
date that there's a sort of initial report and then a final. Great. Um, and really got into the fact that what we're getting at here is we're trying to get information in order to act on it and legislate in 2022 around exclusionary discipline. But that might not be possible depending on how we structure the time frame of their work. Because if we aren't getting a report until say April of 2022, you know, it's too late in the session. About January, this January. That's so we talked about January, January 1, and we also talked about it, you know, that there's that's the initial, but the final wasn't due until later. Can we do January 15th? And that's what I would suggest. And then we could get a, we could get a final, you know, March 15th or something that would at least get us to, that would get something started. We, we sort of went in the circle yeah. of, um, uh, you know, uh, compiling all of the data for the task force to look at might take a long time. But then what we were basically told was, well, actually, they can't have very much data because it's all FERPA and you can't really get at it. So they're not going to have that much data to have to worry about. So anyway, I think those two dates will probably work fine. Okay. So January 15th? Yes. And you, and you want to do January and March or just January? April 1? I think January and March is the way to go. March 15th, that gets us kind of through crossover. You could start working on something. Okay. All right. Final thing for us left to resolve, page 13. This is the big one. Are we... First decision is, are we going into independent schools? Are we applying this to independent schools? And then if so, how do we define independent schools? Is it independent schools that are approved or those that receive public dollars? I didn't realize there's a distinction. Some get the approval, but don't. So generally when we talk about independent schools, we're always yeah. talking about approved independent schools, yeah. meaning that taxpayer dollars could go there. Well, no, I think, um, I think Rice, for example, is an approved independent school. But right. Uh, yeah, somebody oh, tried, you might have jumped right. off, Peter, that there's a somebody it was new info to me that there is a distinction, you know, that there are might have been Ted Fisher that raised it. There are independent schools, they want the recognition of being approved in that name, right. but they don't actually take public dollars. That's right. That's right. Yep. They get the so, they get the quality standards. Yep. But they don't get the money. So I, I my concern here is first of all. I think everybody who knows me well enough knows that, yeah, I'm all for applying the same rules across all systems. Um, but the, the trouble we have right now is that uh, um, we, well, farther up in the bill, we talked about gathering the data from independent schools, but what the, the task force will learn is that there really is no data. They don't have to comply with it. But so that'll be a result that they'll find. Uh, but section seven here, uh, um, I just don't want to slow this bill down. I, I have communicated um, with uh, Mill about getting some feedback from the field on this. I haven't heard back from him. Hopefully we'll talk tonight or tomorrow morning. Um, and I guess my concern is that uh, if this turns into a thing, that it, it could hold up a valuable bill that we need to move along. And that the task force can probably identify and probably will identify the inequity among approved independent schools that take taxpayer dollars and public schools. Yeah, something that can be applied later. So we, what you're recommending, um, Rep. Conlon, is that we leave it as written and not insert. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Uh, agree. Uh, that, that is that? unless they get back to me and say, "Yeah, we don't really have a problem with that. Go for it." Uh, unlikely, of course. But. Yeah, I, I don't want to slow this process down personally. I'd like to put it I agree. in action. Are we yeah, it seems like it's, it's going to raise, um, it could turn this into a bill about independent schools. Right. <laughs> and I mean, there, there's, there's an issue there, no doubt. But those, if we lose, if we go down that road, we might lose the ability to deal with all schools. <laughs> yeah, um, and that rule is open right now in front of the school, uh, State Board of Education. The special ed, oh. independent school rule, at least, is open. So right. that's being well, and, that, now. 
as I think uh, somebody from the AOE said, you know, this there's a whole broad, you know, a whole broad issue here about all things dealing with approved independent schools that take taxpayer dollars and how they're treated versus public schools. And this would just be a tiny fraction of that. So maybe wait for the broader look. Okay. So do those, does those, does that markup sound okay? Just that's all of our, there's a few other things that are being changed. Jim's working on already based on discussions we had this morning, but those were the things that were left for Peter and I to unilaterally decide or ask all of you. <laughs> no, thank you so much. Yeah. Probably the, the biggest change from our discussion yesterday was the findings portion about the data not being available. And then we found yeah. out that the data is available, but is it readily available or is it hard to get at? Um, and that's being tweaked as well, right, Aaron? Yeah, so that's gonna be, I mean, in a sense, kind of watered down quite a bit from what it is right now in the draft. Um, but AOE, Dr. Geller certainly had really <laughs> compelling evidence that there is a lot of data. It is maybe hard to, to understand, but it, it certainly felt like we were speaking maybe a mistruth here about the AOE and that, you know, that, that is not the intent. So, um, so seven under findings is going to end up being significantly shorter and more concise. Um, right. And that seemed to be, yeah. So uh, we're, Jim's getting final language from Ted Fisher on that, but we had a good discussion. I think we were. Thank you. There's kind of two bills in one here because this started as a the exclusionary thing and then also Senator Sears data collection thing. Yeah. So it's a little yeah. bit messy in, in some ways. And that sounds like he really was looking at national data and unaware of some of the things that were happening in our own backyard. So I think clarifying that so that it's Vermont specific would be very helpful or at least includes the, the true picture of the data that we have. Um, and, and I want to uh, note, um, Rep. James, that the he has the language to add a finding on um, LGBT students as well. So that'll be added in the findings. Great. Okay, I think um, I'm, I'm looking around. Are, are we okay at this point to move on with those? We'll get another draft. Uh, I'm still working on the act one um, language for the support. I, I did, well, I was able to hear, and we can, we can bring them on the back, but I did hear that the agency did offer them before the uh, everything shut down, some of the things that were available from the Agency of Education to support the group, but they have not had an opportunity to access. So um, I, I wanna make sure that they have an opportunity to access the resources at the agency. Um, as well as making sure that if those resources aren't there, that there's an opportunity um, for outside. I've got something somewhere. I'll see if I can find it that shows the, the resources that they did offer. And I think in the time with everything being shut down, I think that they did uh, access uh, the agency one time for support on something. Um, Representative James. Thanks, Chair Webb. So are we going to be discussing that? I, I'm sorry, I didn't hear what you said was our next step on that. Um, I'm trying to get some language um, related to, it. I looked at the way it was written in Act 1, and the Act 1 language was pretty limited in terms of what was available um, to them. However, the agency did not take that as that's all we'll do for you is, is um, schedule your meetings. They, they've made the offer to say we're available to help with other things as well. So I'm, I'm working on some language right now to address whether either we're gonna say expand the, the role of the AOE um, in writing, if that would make everybody feel better. You know, because they're saying, you know, minutes, things like that. They, they're looking for technical support. They're looking for those kind of things as well. Interpretation of, of language they were looking for. Those services are available within the agency. Yeah. Um, to be able to look to the agency first. And if that's not available, then put, potentially uh, you know, allow the, uh, create an appropriation for the, for appropriations to seek um, uh, 
additional outside support. Okay. Yeah. Cause I just, I, I just keep, you know, um, and, you know, hearing or thinking that there's um, this one very kind of distinct bucket of support that AOE can, can provide and will provide and, and, you know, looks forward to providing around interpretation and technical support and meetings and stuff like that. And then there's the, um, beyond that, the testimony that we heard from Amanda and from, um, boy, I apologize. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Sorry. Uh, senior, almost senior moment um, about, you know, wanting uh, a level of sort of lived experience and deep, you know, kind of um, knowledge of, um, of, you know, the context of the act one context in, in really reviewing those, um, the standards. And I, I think that's what they feel is, is, you know, maybe that's where they need to want to look to an outside consultant and go beyond AOE. And I, I just don't want to rule that out now in case they need that over the summer or after we adjourn. And I, I'm not sure that that's, I, I didn't get the feeling from Amanda anyway, that she thought that level of help was available at the AOE. We can bring them back. Uh, Representative Brown. Yeah, just to, to sort of um, add on to that, I think um, I, I agree with that. And I think what I was hearing is, you know, sort of beyond the lived experience and expertise that's currently part of the Act One working group, that they need um, sort of scholarly and academic expertise around doing that standards work. You know, something, and the group, um, as we've discussed, is, you know, very talented and capable in their own right. But I think even that, I think we've heard them say they need even that higher level from someone who's really done some deep academic work um, on these issues to really help guide them in an effective way. I'm open to somebody wanting to come up with some language. Okay. And then we just have to figure out where, how we fund it whether we can make it available through federal funds or not, or if it's general fund. Because right now the general fund, I would have a very hard time getting it from the general fund. But if we can figure out a way to tie it to federal funds, um, that'd be great. Anything else? Okay, I think we've exhausted ourselves. I don't know about you, but I'm tired. <laughs> so let's see about tomorrow. What's happening tomorrow? Oh, big day tomorrow on S13. Yeah, yeah. tomorrow we will be um, taking up S13. Um, we are gonna have invited Tammy Colby in. Uh, the way that S13 right now, the primary focus of S13 is the task force and what are the questions that we want to pose to the task force so i mean i definitely heard some questions that were flying around today and i have some of my own and and rather than us trying to answer them in committee are these questions that should be put forward to the task force so i, I want people to think as we're going forward with that lens as well It's a, it's a big question and it needs to be thoughtfully done. I mean, that's the purpose of a task force. We have a study, but we didn't have an implementation plan. Okay.